If you have ever spent time on lakes in the northern United States and Canada, I'm sure you are familiar with the common loon. Here, a pair quietly interacts. And here, in the early morning mists, a pair produces their characteristic tremulo, or laughing call. But all is not peaceful in the world of looms. These two females are fighting over a territory. Why do loons fight? And why is a territory so important to a loon? My colleagues and I have been studying a population of banded loons for the past 18 years, and we have begun to find the answers uh, to some of these questions. In the normal course of events, one loon looks very much like another loon. And it was the work of David Evers, now of biodiversity, who figured out how it to catch loons and put bands on them. And Professor Walter Piper, my colleague, uh, will show you how that's done. You know, it's <laughs> tense to find them um, once they start diving. That, that's tricky and, and testy. But the trick at night is to not get things. Whoa. Whoa. Another thing that the spotlight. Silver over mint. Silver over mint. White over taupe stripe. White over taupe stripe. Yeah, it's a little... When you mark and can individually recognize an animal, especially an animal like loons, uh, like the loon that is uh, in which all individuals are identical, uh, you've really got a leg up on the system and, and if you can consistently, you know, if you can mark individuals and then consistently um, find, see all of the, the markers that you put on them to, to uh, recognize who you've actually got there day after day after day so that if anything, uh, you have any departure from that, uh, you can, like that bird being displaced from its territory, uh, you can pick that up. That is a uh, that gives you a, a real window into the system that, that uh, doesn't otherwise exist. But the, the real driving force of the study is uh, our desire to learn about uh, territorial behavior, to use the loons to learn, ask questions about territorial behavior that are hard to to address in other systems because we can mark the loons, because they're long-lived and we tend to, once marked, they tend to remain so because they're t faithful to their territories. Do they mate for life? And uh, this legend has grown uh, uh, about loons over the years and of course it could grow, um, it's, it's, it makes sense that it could grow because until you band and, and kind of individually identify loons, all of them look more or less alike. It's very difficult to tell one loon from another. Males are larger than females, but otherwise it's very difficult to tell them apart. And so, you know, the people who come up to their lake, they see a, a pair of loons that look just like the loons from last year, and they say, well, it's the, the loons are back. And the answer, and, and loons, loons don't mate for life. They, they, there are takeovers that occur. Uh, both males and females are liable to lose their breeding slot uh, to, uh, you know, a male could lose it to another male who comes in and, and displaces it from the territory, sometimes fatally. Um, females also get displaced commonly from their territories, and, and so they don't mate for life, 
uh, they seem to practice the strategy that um, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a rough um, way of stating it, but uh, loons seem to have an allegiance to their territory that's very strong, and they'll remain on that territory in most cases uh, for many years. Uh, but they don't have a strong allegiance to their mate. When their mate gets displaced from a territory, uh, the, the loon will, uh, will pair with the, the usurper of the territory. And so one of, the, uh, one of the hypotheses is that, that males become senile, and uh, we, our evidence for that is that males do lose, tend to lose mass over time on their territories, whereas females do not. And uh, so that is consistent with the idea that perhaps males are, are becoming less, uh, are declining in their condition to a point perhaps where they become easy prey for a, a, a large fit aggressive intruder. Another part of the story, in, inevitably, I'm sure, is that males and females have a, an interesting contrast in their nesting behavior, their, their contributions to nesting behavior. Uh, this is something that, that no other study has, has found, uh, to our knowledge. Um, we, males and females both look for nests together. Uh, and. Uh, to observe them, it looks like both males and females are, are interested in finding the best nest location. But if you look at it closely, and you look at the data, and, and what you find is that it's males that are, that are the ones that are looking for, uh, for the nests, or the one, they're the ones that are positioning the nests. The males, male loons have a very simple rule, as do many species of animals. Uh, and that rule is, it's called the wind stay lose switch rule. And it just means if you've succeeded in producing chicks or produce young at a certain breeding site, we use that site. Very common sense rule of thumb that, that many animals employ. Uh, and um, so males, uh, so we know that breeding pairs, years ago we would have said, well, breeding pairs obviously use the win, stay, lose, switch rule. But we've accumulated enough data on marked pairs and we have enough cases where, where one or the other a member of a pair has been displaced so that we can look and see, well, what happens if a pair produces chicks from this nest site and then the male gets displaced uh, and the next year it's a new male and an old female? Do they, use, do they still continue to use the rule? And uh, to make a long story short, when, a when the male turns over, uh, the pair suddenly stops using the rule altogether. Uh, even though the old female is there and potentially possesses the information about where to nest, that information doesn't make it to the next nesting attempt. Fem that old female that's been on the territory for a dozen years is completely at the mercy of, of her ignorant new mate uh, when he comes in, and she just has to nest wherever he decides to, to nest. Attempt. On the other hand, if you have a female displaced on a territory uh, and a new female come in with the old male, that, that pair continues to act just, as, just like a, a pair that's com completely unchanged from the previous year. That is, they continue to use the rule. Loons are long-lived organisms. 
Um, we, now that we've started to market a large number of them, we're realizing, somewhat to our chagrin, how long-lived they are, just hoping to outlive some of our <laughs> my study animals. And uh, so, considering that these birds live 25 or 30 years, it means that an average loon will have to uh, deal with uh, breeding on at least two or three or four, perhaps more, uh, different territories during its lifetime. Uh, since we started to mark many chicks beginning in 1998, essentially saturation banding of all the chicks that are produced in our territory, and uh, beginning in 1998, and it's now 2008, it's been 10 years since we've started that process, and we've had well over 100 uh, of these young birds, we call them ABJs, adults banded as juveniles. Uh, that's our little terminology. Uh, we've gotten a lot of ABJs coming back, uh, birds coming back to the near vicinity of where they were, were banded three or four or five years before. And so that allows us, gives us a, really a unique window into the process of territory acquisition by, by young animals. Very few studies have enough enough animals marked as young individuals who are looking for territories to be able to say, ah, this, this animal has, has, is, was hatched here four years ago. It's setting up a, a, it's visiting, intruding in these territories in this particular area. It's living on this big lake over here and it ultimately uh, evicts a male or usurps the territory from this male in this territory. And so it's giving us a great deal of exciting information. Loons have a number of different vocalizations, and I've asked Jay Mager, a professor at Ohio Northern University, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, the sounds they make and what we believe to be the meaning of those sounds. Uh, loons characteristically give um, three vocalizations that uh, are um, able to be communicated over long distance. Uh, the first is a wail, which is the haunting uh, call of the loon, the laugh-like tremolo, uh, and the yodel. Um, the wail has been long believed to be a contact call. It is a call that's often given by uh, mates to find one another or perhaps mates looking for um, misplaced chicks. Tremolos are basically um, when loons are agitated, so it's believed to be uh, a signal given when they're threatened. Um, whereas the yodel tends to be a call that tends to be territorial in nature, that it's only given by males, and it's usually given in the context of when an intruder has flown into or is flying over the territory. is being communicated by the yodel are three things. Uh, first of all, what I think the yodel is communicating is something about the identity of the individual male giving the yodel. Um, that is, it's indicating that I am Bob, or I am Ted, or I am the resident loon of this particular territory. Uh, I also believe that the yodel is communicating something about the relative fighting ability or strength of the bird. That is, how big the individual is, is and therefore what type of a physical struggle that an intruder might be uh, uh, looking at as a, um, a potential threat. Lastly, I think the yodel is also communicating something about the aggressive motivation or willingness to defend that territory. Uh, that is, how agitated they are and how willing they are to try to displace any type of intruder. that each individual male loon has his own characteristic yodel. The surprise, however, is that when a male is displaced or takes over another territory, it changes its yodel. And it doesn't just change it at random, it changes it to be as different as possible uh, from that of the previous male on the territory. For some reason, it seems to be very important for the loon to say, new loon on the block, as it were. So now, the next time you see loons on a lake or listen to their haunting cries 
in the early morning mist, you can appreciate what an interesting and complex social system they have, and how much we have been able to learn by studying marked individuals.